Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Meadows Museum. Um, let me go ahead and remind everybody before I begin to uh, go ahead and silence your cell phones, please. It happens all the time. <clears throat> So um, we're very pleased that you could join us this evening uh, for our first lecture that's held in conjunction with our um, uh, recently opened exhibition, Process and Innovation, Carlotta Corcoran and Janet Turner. Tonight's speaker is Dr. John Rohrbach, Senior Curator of Photographs at the Eamon Carter Museum. Dr. Rohrbach started his career at George Eastman House in Rochester, New York, and was director of the Paul Strand Archive before earning his doctorate in American Civilization from the University of Delaware in 1993. Since coming to the Carter in 93, Dr. Rohrbach has curated numerous photography exhibitions, including Robert Adams, True West, Elliot Porter, The Color of Wildness, Regarding the Land, Robert Glenn Ketchum and the Legacy of Elliot Porter, Ansel Adams, Eloquent Light, Color, American Photography Transformed, and most recently, That Day, Laura Wilson, which closed just this past weekend. His publications include Framing the New Topographics, Accommodating Nature, the photographs of Frank Golke, and A Passion for Birds, Elliot Porter's Photography. He has also contributed to numerous essays and spoken on a wide variety of photographic subjects. As the Carter holds the archive of Carlotta Corcoran and has generously lent to our exhibition a group of letters, we have invited Dr. Warbach to speak on the topic of her work in his lecture tonight, Carlotta Corcoran, Stretching Reality. Please join me in welcoming Dr. John Warbach. Thank you, Scott. That was a very nice introduction. Um, you always get a little bit concerned when people talk about you, <laughs> but um, he synopsized things quite well. And, and the other thing that really impresses me, and I'll speak, speak up, um, is this show is beautifully installed. Um, I'm very impressed somebody, as somebody who has uh, been partially designing and installing shows for more than 20 more or plus years. I'll just leave it at that. Um, I, I'm very impressed that, that, that this show in a small, relatively confined space has a sense still of spaciousness, beauty, and completeness. Um, so that's a credit to the Meadows Museum and, and Nicole Atzbach, who uh, was, is the curator of the show. Now, before I get into speaking, and maybe we can keep, put the lights down a little bit, um, I just want to admit something, and that is that when Scott approached me to give this talk, I hesitated. Because I told him I wasn't really an expert on Corcoran, and that I hadn't met, spent a lot of time sorting through her achievements. So I'm really relieved that Beverly Wilgus has agreed to reminisce about her days of Corpin, and I encourage you to come to that talk. Certainly, anybody who walks into the exhibition in the other room here can't help but be impressed by the imaginative variety of Corpin's work, and I've long been impressed by that component of her work, and have regularly selected her, sh her photographs for shows at the Eamon Carter Museum, usually collection surveys. We've done a sm few small uh, one-room shows of her work. And I've, of course, read Martha Sanwise's 1980 retrospective catalog um, essay, and that little booklet, which is still the main booklet on Corcoran, is in the exhibition here. <coughs> Excuse me. But my hesitations came because I never really bought into those six categories by which Marnie Sanwais and others have structured Corcoran's work, and including Corcoran herself. So uh, just to review, I'll give you those six categories, and, and I want to create a sort of counter argument to those six categories. The other thing, just before I mention those categories, is that um, you'll find working in any kind of artist archives, and it's particularly true for photographers, that if they partic if particularly those who go back and reprint things later in life or not as organized as people like Elliot Porter who is a scientist and meticulous about writing down e absolutely everything. Um, dates oftentimes are all over the place. They might date a negative at one date and a print at three or four different other dates. And Corcoran is no exception. Um, I find prints within our archive 
which have widely different dates, and that's within the context of her working for a very short period of time. She might date something in the early 40s at the same time she dates another print from that grouping in the late 40s. So it's a little bit of a struggle, and I've taken some liberty in some of the dating to try to build an argument that I hope is convincing tonight. So let me get back to those six categories, because Corcoran herself set those categories, and they're um, reinforced not only by Sandweiss, but even if you come to our museum website and look at our Corcoran collection guide, um, that collection guide is organized by those categories, and they're roughly chronological, supposedly, although I'm not convinced. They start with nature studies. The second category is light drawings. The third category is light patterns. The fourth category, light follows form. You're following a little, I'm sure you can follow a little pattern here. Then space compositions, and then fluid light designs. Now what this talk has done for me is given me an excuse to look a little harder at the issue. And I want to start with Corcoran's roots, because I'll, I assume that most of you know of Corcoran's work. I just want to give a little back background for those of you who don't. And, and I want to start by going up to Denton, see if I can do this here, and open with a proposition that Denton, Texas, hasn't really reached that status of being the center of the art photography universe. Excuse me, let me go back. And that in 1935, when Carlotta Corcoran arrived at Texas State College for Women, now Texas Women's University, and I'll use that term when I refer to the college through my lecture. When she arrived there to teach in 1935, the school was not one of those great destination programs for art. She was hired as a design professor she had only recently taught herself how to make photographs. Here we see flowing with light, flowing light, which is done a little bit towards the end of her most active part of her career. I understand in doing, in looking at our archive and from the show here, that she was a very capable and very demanding teacher. Indeed, as we see from the show here, some of her students created photographs that hold up to anything not only of that day, but of today. And that's impressive. That's a real statement about a teacher. And here we see her student Ida Lansky's photograph, Trist, made in 1957 or 58. Ida Lansky must have had a restless mind, just like Corcoran. She initially trained in New York City to be a public health nurse before studying art at TWU from 1954 to 1959. And again, I'm using the current title for the university just to help you out. And then going on to take up a career as a librarian. So Corcoran must have been the perfect teacher for Lansky because both women clearly loved experimenting with unusual photographic techniques besides making this relatively straightforward photograph. She would flash her papers during development and at times splash hot water on her negatives to deliberately distort the emulsion. Here she creates a stage narrative of sorts out of three biometric drawing aids. Barbara Maples, you see another work of hers in the show here, was a Texas native who graduated from Baylor University and then Columbia University's teacher college before coming back to North Texas to teach art in various public schools in the Metroplex. She also taught art classes at the Dallas Museum of Art from 1940 to 54 and headed the Pro Department of Art Education here at SMU from 65 to 78. And it was during the last part of this career that she made this photograph. Maple's art focus was painting, printmaking, and ceramics, not photography. She apparently approached Corcoran around the time she came to SMU for guidance in making slides, not art photographs, simply to assist with her teaching. They hit it off and met informally together for weekends on weekends for years. 
Here, Maple seems to have overlapped several pieces of paper and lit them from above and below. The result is an abstraction so soft in form that it could be mistaken for a charcoal drawing. But Maples does not stop there. She goes on to mount the negatives and positive versions of the image side by side in virtual mirror counterpoint, entitled the work Energy. To see more of both Maples and Lansky's work, indeed work of a variety of her students, I encourage you to take a look at Christian Gertzheimer's catalog called Texas, titled Texas Bauhaus, published by the El Paso Museum of Art in 2006. But let me get back to Corcoran. Carlotta Corcoran brought to Denton in 1935 an intriguing mix of innocence and sophistication. Born in 1901 amidst the farmlands of southern Minnesota, at age four, she was taken by her missionary surgeon father to northeast India. And there she received her initial education in an English boarding school set amidst the Himalayas. What a way to grow up. She came back to the States and gained her bachelor's degree in art education at what's now Eastern Michigan University, and then got her master's blending art education and fabric design in New York City at Columbia University's Teachers College. Before coming to Denton, she taught art appreciation and textile design at colleges in Alabama and Ohio, teaching herself photography to assist with her design lectures. Only when she arrived at Texas Women's University was she asked to teach a course in photography. And only then did she become interested in the medium as a medium for art. Now, Corcoran taught at TWU until 1968, but she focused on making her own creatively based photographs for a mere decade, from 1940 to 1950. Over the next 25 years, she largely set her camera aside. Although she had a couple of shows early on, most notably in 1953 at the Art Institute of Chicago, her art career went into eclipse. Only in 1975, when her work was included in a group show called Women in Photography, and it was a period of time when museums and dealers were so-called rediscovering that women could make fine art photographs and that they were interesting. Only then did the art world start to pay attention to Corcoran's work once again. And by 1977, she had picked up representation in New York City with Marcuse Pfeiffer Gallery. And then in 1980 and 81, she started working with the Eamon Carter Museum, leading to a, night, to a retrospective at our museum, which Martha Sandweiss uh, curated and wrote the catalog, which you see in the display in the other room. Now, taking her guidance from Corcoran's own 1977 description of her work, Sandweiss explains in that catalog that Corcoran's six categories, remember that I mentioned earlier, represent phases in her exploration of light with nature studies being the earliest phase and ending with fluid light designs. Ultimately, Sandweiss concludes, the way to understand Corcoran is to think about light, concluding that exploring and reimagining light was the artist's end goal. And in fact, she's following Corcoran's own words. She liked to be seen and understood, as the exhibition display suggests, as a designer with light. So that in many ways, Sandweiss is right. In an article written more than a decade after giving up fine art photographs, Corcoran extols light as the key to photography and organizes her thoughts in terms of class assignments for investigating the properties of light. Think in terms and work in terms of bright light, soft light, direct light, oblique light, reflected light, delineating form and texture through light, creating abstractions with light, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. However, if we correlate Sandweiss's assertion that Corcoran's ultimate achievement is to capture the essence of light with the dates of Corcoran's prints, at least those in our museum collection, we find that the artists often made many of her most direct studies of light early in the decade of her most active art making. While during the second half of that decade, 
the photographs attended more to form, space, and metaphor. As I've looked at Corcoran's photographs and, six, and considered her six category framework, I've come to appreciate the deep influence of the importance of the influence and the importance of the influential German art academy, the Bauhaus, and how, what, that, what influence that had on her outlook, particularly her embrace of the pedagogical methods of two key Bauhaus artists, the Hungarian emigres Laszlo Moholy Naj and Georgi, Georgi Kepesh. Her six categories, in fact, clearly come from the, that foundation. So it leads me to conclude that the categories are more Bauhaus art assignments than series in the true sense of the word. Let me explain what I mean. Maholi Naj, and you see him in the center of this image, teaching at Texas Women's University in 1942. He came to teach for a semester there that year, shortly after Corcoran had started teaching photography herself. Of course, Maholi was a painter, printmaker, sculptor, designer as much of a, as a photographer. He had taught at the Bauhaus from 1923 to 1928 before coming to the States in 1937 and founding the new Bauhaus in Chicago. The Bauhaus, of course, was that premier school of art modernism, teaching everything from architecture to the design of typefaces. Under its widely influential program, art and craft were intertwined and form followed function. The program also was a page from the abstract, also took a page, excuse me, from abstract paintings and designs coming out of the Soviet Union. The key was to break up our habit of seeing a chair merely as a chair, to consider it as shape, weight, texture, form, and space. When the Nazis forced the school to shut, Maholi Naj first went to England and then in 1936 came to the United States to set up this new school. The school would be renamed the School of Design in 1939 and 1949 would become uh, would be renamed again as the Institute of Design and would become by the late 50s the leading art photography program in the United States, attracting such teachers as Harry Callahan and Aaron Siskin and graduating innovative artists like Barbara Crane, Joseph Jackna, and Ken Josephson. And if you're interested in exploring that, I recommend that you take a look at a book called Taken by Design, published by the Art Institute of Chicago in 2002. Here we see the new Bauhaus curriculum, the diagram that they used in 1937 and 1938. And, and if you look at it closely, oops, excuse me, let me go back. If you look at it closely, you'll see this little tiny section deals with photography, very little. It was only a small part of that program in those early years. But it was a key foundation course taken by all incoming students, and Maholi Naj's own interest in the medium gave it added import. Maholi Naj, excuse me, Maholi Naj was passionate about teaching and about photography, calling it the language of the future. He particularly liked photographs that transcended straightforward depiction. His goal in teaching the medium was to break his students of their snapshot proclivities. And he did so by challenging them to photograph an extreme close-up or from strongly angled viewpoints and to make photograms like this one, which is his own, made in around 1942, by place, made by placing objects on a photographic paper and then exposing it to light. Back in Germany, he had coined the term the new vision to describe the kind of teaching and the kind of photography that he wanted students to make. And in fact, they would open up their photo one class. You go to your first class, your first semester at a new school, by directing students in the classroom to look around the classroom, pull together anything that they saw, and put it on a central table. And then the challenge was, make an interesting photograph of it. The idea was, not, was to break habits and to get them attuned, not only to objects as form, but to notice how they absorbed and reflected light. 
They then moved on to the photogram not to study form as much as gradations of total range. By working with printing out paper, exposures could be longer and objects and, light, and lights could be moved over the course of the time. Corcoran was Maholi Naj's assistant during his semester stay in Denton. And under his supervision, she led a workshop on light. And you see one of her photographs, photograms out in the display, a wonderful use of glass prisms. So she supervised the workshop on light, teaching her students how to make those photograms. Unfortunately, her development as a photographic artist had not evolved at the time of Maholi Naj's visit, enough to interest the master artist teacher. It didn't help that Maholi Naj was a misogynist, thinking that women's roles were to be housewives and assistants to men rather than artists themselves. Prior to Maholi's arrival in Denton, Corcoran made images like this as sparks to her students' study of advertising and textile design. She was enthralled by the varied <coughs> patterns of flowers and leaves. So it was natural that she, natural sort of, natural that she turned her camera to these forms. She liked this photograph, for example, because she hoped that the complex patterns of the plant's flower might coax her students into exploring this similar intricate detail in their design work. Looking at this photograph starts me wondering, what happened to the side of the plant facing the camera? Was it eaten? Did it really look like that? And what would the flower look like when it was fully open? You can see I don't know my botany very well. The framing is, seems a bit simple, but it's clearly more than a snapshot for Corcoran. She titled it Guardian of the Forest. Certainly from this vantage point, the plant's scale becomes uncertain. Is it really as large as it seems? I start to wonder whether we've entered a neverland. Corcoran's early preoccupation with design also led her to make images like this view of a carnival ride in Dallas's Fair Park, where she let her camera simply drop during the middle of the exposure. Here, too, the title is significant. She called it Commentary on Civilization, to reflect her feelings that most people follow each other blindly around in circles, rather than thinking and acting for themselves. She even called the line to the right there herself, separated and looking back at the crowd. She was the rebel, the knowing one. Corcoran was not always good about keeping track of those dates as, of her images, as I mentioned, but this semi-abstract study of a banana leaf also fits her early, early teaching outlook. Strikingly graphic, it embraces an aesthetic made popular starting in the late 20s by photographers like Edward and Brett Weston and Imogen Cunningham. And I'll give you an example of what I mean. On the left is the banana leaf made in the, early, in the 1940s, I would suggest the early 1940s. And on the right, you see Imogen Cunningham's cow lily leaves made around 1929. Now notice how Corcoran generally centers her image subjects and how Cunningham, by allowing the tips of the cow lily leaves to break the edges of the frame, makes the space around the flower to be as active as the plant itself. But Corcoran was learning. And around the time that Maholi Naj's arrival in Denton in 1942, she made this more compositionally integrated image, a celebration of the world of built geometrical form. And she then flipped the negative back on itself several times to arrive at this result. Although she may well have created the version under Maholi Naj's own advice and dictate, not merely to record, but to take us beyond that boring Cartesian world. She also was creating images like this night shot of a Hermana church. Here too, she fills the frame, dropping the solid world away, forcing us to extrapolate from experience to piece together the image subject. Light certainly was a deep interest for Corcoran. After Maholi Naj's stop in Denton while visiting a Daytona beach in Florida, uh, 
she, uh, Daytona Beach, Florida Carnival, excuse me. She played with our conception of materiality by swinging her camera back and forth, and particularly to the right during exposure, to create this pyramid, a form that, unlike the church in that previous slide, doesn't really exist in reality. Now, such writing with light was by no means unique. New York photographer Barbara Morgan, whose work you see here, titled Pure Energy and Neurotic Man, had been making these kinds of flashlight drawings, drawing photographs, since 1940. And Corcoran may well have known about Morgan's work, either through Moholy Nagy or from her own studies of other photographers' work. But where Morgan's images were clearly drawings with a flashlight, Corcoran was embracing a world transformed. Here, by moving her camera in various directions, and perhaps using multiple exposures, she breaks not a drawing, she delivers, excuse me, not a drawing, but a world unto itself, filled with activity. I can't help, when I look at this image, of thinking about the drips and slashes being produced around the same years by Franz Klein, Robert Motherwell, Jackson Pollock. But pure abstraction wasn't Corcoran's end goal. The art act of making also wasn't her point. The image has a strange depth to it, a sense that we're looking not at action for its own sake, but into another space. Then, in 1944, Georgi Kepesh arrived in Denton. Kepesh was like Moholy Naj, a painter, designer, photographer, and teacher. He had met Maholi in Berlin and been invited by him to join the new Bauhaus staff in Chicago to head up its program for the first year students. Shortly before coming to Denton, he had been lured to Brooklyn College. A few years later, in 1947, he would go on to initiate the visual design program at MIT, what then became, eventually became the Center for Advanced Visual Studies. Out of her conversation with Maholi, Corcoran had been thinking about requesting a sabbatical to study with Kepesh. Imagine her delight then, when instead Kepesh came to her. He arrived not to TWU, but at least across town to UNT in 1944, and not to teach, but to complete his book, Language of Vision, which would be, go on to become one of the main textbooks used by college design programs across the U.S. for years. Now, Kepesh refused Corcoran's request for formal lessons, but he agreed to meet informally with her every week to look at her photographs and to talk about photography. And over the course of his year in Texas, he became her close friend, mentor, and inspiration. In fact, you see a note out in the exhibition where he suggests that he learned as much from her as she from him. And in fact, out of that relationship, out of that year, Corcoran would come to call Kepesh her only real photographic influence. Kepesh introduced Corcoran to several tools developed by his former student and now colleague Nathan Lerner, including this light filtering mechanism through which Lerner showed lights of different colors. And this light box. Now, Lerner had entered the new Bauhaus as a student in 1937, and by 1941 was heading the school's photography program. The box itself was a mere starting point. The goal was to broaden students' appreciation of the language of light by shining lamps of various intensities through its myriad holes and putting strips of film, cut and curved paper, other objects within the box to shift and modulate the light. Almost immediately, Corcoran built her own two by three foot box, poked holes through its side. That box helped her further her connections to the world as we interact with it in daily life. Kepesh and Lerner, and Lerner were teaching their students, and here's a work by one of her students a study called A Study in Surface Treatment. They were teaching their students to think in terms not merely of light, gradation, texture, but also of overlapping form, 
adding multiple exposures to Moholy Naj's photographs. They taught their students, and here's another piece called Exercise in Transparent Planes. They taught their students to add dimensions by overlapping forms and explore how objects on different planes facing different directions might interact with each other. And to make images like this, which I like to call the light road to infinity, <laughs> done by a student named McVicker. And it's merely titled Study in Linear Movement. It was made in 1938. But the program at ID was more than a matter of playing visual games. Kepish's broader goal was to get his students to think beyond object reality and to think of objects abstractly as lines, planes, and colors. Kepish himself used these new ideas and, cruel, and tools to create this remarkable issue, image that he calls the pleasures of light, where solidity blends so fluidly into abstraction that we feel like we've entered an entirely new world, one with form, depth, pattern, and a strange beauty. Now to clarify what's going on, I just want to show one of Corcoran's works, A Walk in Fair Park, against Kepish's work, The Pleasures of Light. What's going on here is that Corcoran's images, if you look just at that, suggest depth through overlapping light as it streaks across the page. Whereas Kepish image, Kepish's images suggest real dimensional form through shading and more intricate pattern. But Corcoran was clearly a fast learner. Out of her study with Kepish, she immediately created this entirely new image called bisymmetric design. Here, through simple positioning of light and white paper, she offers her own, what I would might call a highway, more aligned to the kaleidoscopic patterns of the dancers of a Busby Berkeley film than anything she had created before. In short, Kepish's I should say, uh, Nathan Lerner's light box gave Corcoran the key to her mature vision. Corcoran knew she was on to something innovative. So in 1945, after Kepish's return to Brooklyn, and perhaps with Kepish's own encouragement, she traveled to New York City to introduce herself to the great German-American artist, gallerist, promoter, Alfred Stieglitz who you see here at his American Place Gallery in that same in 1944, and to show him some of her prints. Now Stieglitz was important because he had introduced the art world to many of the premier talents of the day, from Edward Steichen and Paul Strand to Ansel Adams and Elliot Porter. For each of these photographers, their exhibition of their work at Stieglitz's gallery had jump-started their career. In other words, if you could get a show with Stieglitz, you were considered a major artist. Here's one of the images that Corcoran, and I'm sorry about the, the uh, little dents up there that are in the print. Here's one of the images that Corcoran may well have brought to Stieglitz. We see a glass cube transformed into a tilting house of mirrored reflections, a place where, as with bisymmetric design, solidity barely exists. She also may have showed this image, and here's where I depart from the, the exhibition in terms of dating. The exhibition placed her egg studies in 1948. Um, I suggest that they may have been made earlier. She's dating some of her photographs in our, in our collection uh, in 1944, so it's something for uh, perhaps Beverly can sort out for us when she speaks. Now, being an art history teacher and a design teacher, Corcoran knew that Kepish had photographed eggs to great effect, and most likely knew of Paul Outerbridge's egg work, Paul Outerbridge's triumph of the egg is on your right there, and that Edward Steichen had spent a year photographing eggs. And you see Edward Steichen's Beginning of the World, made in 1920 on the left. Outerbridge's work is 1932. She also surely recognized that the prevailing practice was to photograph them alone, piled in bowls, to really isolate them as a form. 
But she wanted to move in a different direction, as the images outside in the show suggests, and as this panorama suggests. So one Sunday, she brought six eggs into her small school studio and using ferrotite plates that are thin, highly polished steel plates and simple overhead lighting. She made them stretch, stand on end like pins in a bowling alley and cast odd shadows. The results so excited her that she made 30 photographs that day. She later called them some of her favorite works. Here again, Corcoran had quit photography's standard allegiance to Renaissance perspective, squeezing and elongating the eggs and dissolving depth clarity. But let's take one more step and think about this image, not in terms of a Euclidean world of fixed measurement and separate constant time, but perhaps an homage to last week's announcement of the proving of Einstein's, the last part of Einstein's theory of relativity. Let's think of this image as a, part, as a relativistic world of multiple simultaneous events where appearance and time overlap. The interpretation suggests that Corcoran has fulfilled S.I. Hayakawa's call in one of the opening essays of Kepish's own language of vision. Remember, that's the book that he's finishing up in uh, Denton when he's down there working with Corcoran. S. I. Hayakawa's call to drop our notion of the universe being made up of, quote, statistically conceived isolable objects in an absolute space. And Kepish's own suggestion in that same book that contemporary life seems so confusing because it's structured by such a variety of space-time relationships. Clearly, the idea was in the world, in, in, the, in the world that Kepish and, and uh, Corcoran were discussing. Quite clearly, she was illustrating a world where the division between solidity and reflection has melted away, where eggs can equally stand on edge and stretch into doubled forms. But Stieglitz was hard to impress. He had not shown the work of a new photographer for seven years. That activity, of course, hadn't stopped artist photographers from all over the United States and Europe from flocking to his American Place gallery. Even if he didn't like your photographs, if he found you interesting, he'd happily converse with you for as long as his 81-year-old strength would hold up. Looking through Corcoran's photographs, Stieglitz criticized their soft focus in fact, her darkroom equipment at TWU wasn't the best, and complained to her that everyone seemed to be working with flashlights at the moment. A little dig to the Institute of Design. But he thought enough of Corcoran's images that he asked her to send a selection of contact prints to consider for display. It took her a number of months to do so and pull them together, but she did just that. Unfortunately, Stieglitz died before he opened Corcoran's package. O'Keefe returned the box to her with a generous suggestion that Stieglitz would have wanted her to keep making art. The visit to New York City made Corcoran realize, she later said, that she still had a lot to learn. She seems to have realized, for example, that the glass cube photographs that she was showing that she may have presented to Stieglitz offered the same abstract faceting found in this photograph made by Alvin Langdon Coburn almost 30 years previously in 1917. And the space delivered by the eggs was indeed mushy. The realization led her to re-inject more solidity into her photographs. And the result became images like this chambered Nautilus, which she made in 1945. Here, dimensionality delivers us into a dream world that we can enter and explore, even if it makes no Euclidean sense. Here, the Nautilus shell retains its clear solidity, but seems to float on these metallic swirls. In finding her way to these sensate, yet equally nonsensical worlds, Corcoran did not pre-visualize in the way that Ansel Adams or Walker Evans, or Edward Weston did. She did not map out a result and try to achieve it on film. Rather, she set her tools and then discovered what they could do. 
This 1946 image was born out of disappointment. As a committed teacher, Corcoran was always pushing herself to come up with assignments that would challenge her students. And one day she assigned her students the task of photographing this pack, excuse me, plaster cast. They came back, as most of us probably would, with atrociously sappy results. Doing things like putting a scarf on the cast, a rose in its hair, things like that. And Corcoran made this photograph in response to push her students into thinking harder. It's an exquisite example of how light can literally enliven a form. But still, she wasn't satisfied. Only when she made this subsequent photograph did she feel she'd achieved success. It's a tricky image, so subtle in a shift that one can easily miss the transformation. It's called illusion of male and female. Note, if you can't see it, the face, the split of the face into two figures. Look at the lips in particular. It's the way that this image transcends the world as we know it and expect to understand it that makes the photograph so original. Today, she might have titled it Recognizing Blended Gender. The years between 1945 and 1950 were extraordinarily productive for Corcoran, as America, having triumphed in World War II, was riding an atomic bomb into the Cold War, as its citizens were finding their consumerist bearings in a lifestyle framed by corporations in suburbia, and as abstract expressionism was relocating the art world center from Paris to New York, Corcoran was constructing her own purely photographic world. Investigating how Venetian blinds could deliver equal solidity of light and darkness at the same time. Creating liquid worlds where form, a simple mylar sheet in this case, seems to overlap and turn back on itself. And returning to her plays of light, creating worlds where light is equally solid and atmospheric. Corcoran didn't totally neglect the popular experimental processes of the day, like solarization, the quick flashing of exposed paper with light while it's in the development bath, causing that solarization causes those shadowed edges that you see around the edges of this calla lilies. So it gives them that sort of strange glow. This image, image actually became one of her most famous and sought after works. But she really hit her stride in 1948 when she started creating images like this blend of solidity into dream. Since when have you seen a spatula looking so deeply dimensional and ghoulish? But this is no surrealist effort to resolve the contradictions between dreams and reality, such as we find in the works by the celebrated commercial fashion photographer George Platt Lines on the left who here portrays the Greek mythical shepherd astronomer king Endymion dreaming rapturously of his love, the moon. And Corcoran's friend, Clarence John Laughlin, with his photograph, The Unborn, on the right, who by this date had become a passionate explorer of ghosts of the Southern Civil War past. Corcoran instead was choosing to plunge fully into the dream world, accepting the strange creatures that it delivers. On one level, this image is nothing more than flipping a negative. But Corcoran's title is Light Creates Bird Symbols. The image per perfectly symbolizes Corcoran's, or Ketchum's, excuse me, Kepish's assertion in the language of vision that to perceive a visual image implies the beholder's participation in the process of the organization. But it moves beyond Kepish. Kepish was always the optimist, seeing his teaching as a means for overcoming the cycle of economic recession and war. While Corcoran clearly is not so certain, finding her explorations in a more, to a more, leading to a more belligerent result. 
Remember Corcoran's banana leaf image from about 1940? By 1948, by this date, she was making images like this. A transformation of leaves into almost a combative figure. Note the raised arms to the front. And transforming the reflections delivered by a glass ball, simply sitting on a piece of fan coral, into a figure that seems to rise up and walk toward us. She definitely had found her way to another world, and it wasn't a happy place. She may well have been responding, at least intuitively, to the severe breakdown of her own health, brought in part by her constantly being overextended with her university workload. At some time, points, she apparently taught classes in, not only in photography, but in textile design, advertising design, general design, art education, and even art history. And in 1950, that bad health forced her out of the darkroom. Although Corcoran continued teaching for several more decades and occasionally made photographs, she never returned to her intense art making of the 1940s. It's too bad. She was really on to something quite innovative that I think coders of computer games who want to immerse their players in worlds beyond the imagination can learn from. Thank you so much. Thank you.